I had a really wonderful conversation about a year ago with Dr. William Lee, and he we were, we actually specifically honed in on the st- strobilome and the set of bacteria that yeah. break down estrogen. And we started geeking out on how these bacteria go up the vagus nerve and then go up into the brain and start to stimulate different parts of the brain. And before you know it, we were also geeking out on fermented sourdough and how it can impact the bacteria that make oxytocin. So bring this into some kind of complete understanding for the layperson. Is it these microbes are just hanging out in the gut? And is it the vagus nerve they travel up? How do they get to the brain? And then how do they decide what part of the brain they're going to stimulate? Well, the vagus nerve is just one tiny piece of this puzzle. In fact, I mean, we used to thought when I was in medical school that the vagus nerve was how the brain talked to the gut. And lo and behold, now we know that for every one nerve fiber heading from the brain to the gut, there's mm. nine from the gut heading up to the brain. So we, we, we had it, you know, backwards. But the vagus nerve is just really an old-fashioned telephone line. And, but the sophistication of how these guys control us mm. is now, thanks to the Human Microbiome Project, for instance, I recently was lecturing at, get ready for this, the Society of Extracellular Vesicles. Uh, that, that sounds interesting. <laughs> so what the heck is a, you know, so these are exosomes or extracellular vesicles. And these are little packets of information. I look at them as kind of a link on an email that I click, well, to come on your show. I click mm-hmm. the link and it instantly brought me here. So we now know that bacteria and plants and fungi can pop out little pockets of information that have genetic instructions, can have microRNA, mRNA, and even living mitochondria, and pop them out. And the way these are designed, they can go through the wall of the gut, they can go through blood vessels, they can go through the blood-brain barrier unobstructed, Hmm. merge onto a target cell and release that information and change the epigenetic expression of that cell. Insane. Yeah. And it's like, Holy cow, I thought it was pretty cool that bacteria could send messages up the vagus right. nerve. But now, are you kidding? They're sending, you know, text messages to, and with a link to open it up, and it's going to change, you know, my behavior. And Crazy. talk about sophistication. Wow. And, and it's like, wow, is this complex. How, how could we have imagined that these little one-cell organisms have this incredible, complex control over us? And once you— yeah. Once you see all that, you go, whoa. You know. What kind of behaviors do they control? Just so we could, so people, is it everything in our brain? You know, we, we certainly know, I get this question a lot, you know, GLP-1 agonists are in. We now know it's the microbiome that actually mm-hmm. produces GLP-1. And it's the microbiome production of GLP-1 that if you're feeding the good guys what they need to eat, they basically send GLP-1 up to the brain and said, hey, great news. You ate everything we need. You don't have to go looking for anything else. We're great. You you don't have to be hungry. Now, unfortunately, those guys have mostly been killed off or starved to death. And most of the processed foods and ultra-processed foods that we eat are very simple sugars and saturated fats that a whole different set of bugs can utilize. And in the old days, our great-grandparents ate whole food, and they ate them whole. And so we, in the digestive process, would get, you know, glucose and amino acids and fats, but then there'd be a whole lot left over in terms of polysaccharides, resistant starches that would filter down to the colon where most of these guys live, and there'd be plenty left over. And then these guys say, yep, we got it, no problem. And one of the things that I tell my patients who have this food noise 
in, in their head is, well, we could eat <laughs> a podcast host uh, admitted right before the podcast yesterday that she had consumed eight. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You will, that would, that would never happen with me, but that's did, quite I, an, that's quite an, an admission. I'm yeah. <laughs> I, I say, so let me tell you what just happened. I said, you ate those Oreo cookies and they're simple sugar and fat. And these microbes who love this stuff gobbled it all up and there was nothing left that was coming downstream. And the guys downstream go, wait a minute, I, I heard her chewing up there. I, she swallowed something. I know it's coming. And then nothing arrives. And they go, well, what the heck? I just heard you eating. You got mm -hmm. cheated. We didn't get anything. Go find some more food. So they send out ghrelin, another hormone, to make you hungry. And no wonder these things just set up the cycle of food noise. And that food noise is actually your microbiome. The good guy's going, you're starving me to death. What, mm. you know, what the heck? What are you doing? So you're eating, but you're not feeding these microbes that will send your brain the right signals to turn off hunger. That's exactly right. And so now we've come up with a drug to be able to replicate that. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So what foods should we be avoiding so that we don't destroy these microbes? Well, and it's a, it's a two-step two, two process. You, you can't give these bad guys the food that they can take advantage of, these simple sugars and these fats. You got to starve them. They, they can't utilize long-chain starches. They, they don't have the fermentation mechanism to, mm. break, to break them down. On the other hand, the good guys do have that mechanism, but it's not as simple as it, it sounds. I wish it was. For instance, there's a husband and wife microbiology team at Stanford, the Sonnenbergs, who are real doomsayers of the human microbiome. They, they really think, and they're right, that we basically have a desert wasteland of, of a microbiome rather mm -hmm. than a tropical rainforest. And they don't really think it's, well, we'll ever be able to reestablish our rainforest. I disagree with them, but hmm. they did a beautiful experiment that I, I talk about in the book and in a previous book. They, they took volunteers and everybody knows that the good guys want prebiotic fiber. They want mm -hmm. soluble fiber. And they use a soluble fiber, inulin, which is present in the chicory family of vegetables, radicchio and Belgian endive. Oh, radicchio. Yeah. It's my favorite. And, and the great thing is you can find it in almost every grocery store now. It's not in the weird health food section anymore. Mm -hmm. And asparagus has inulin. Artichoke hearts have inulin. So they gave volunteers lots of inulin. And they looked at their gut microbiome diversity. And they looked at markers of inflammation and they gave them all this stuff and nothing changed. The gut microbiome didn't change. Their hmm. inflammation markers didn't change. Yeah. And you go, hmm, well, wait a minute. That's what those guys want to eat. They said, you know, we're missing something here. There's got to be some precursors that I've written about for many books now called postbiotics. These are essentially the products of bacterial fermentation, of eating things. And we should give these people, in addition to the inulin, we should give them some fermented foods. They chose yogurt and kefirs. You could have chosen sauerkraut or kimchi. You could have chosen vinegar. Mm -hmm. And we'll do the same experiment. Give them the inulin, but give them this. Now, with the addition of these postbiotic foods, these fermented foods, the gut diversity increased and the inflammation markers mm. decreased. So it, it, to talk about Hillary Clinton, it takes a village. And right. that's really what has to happen. And so, you, so bringing more fermented foods in is really key to the diversity of, yeah. Yeah, I, I can I can really, you know, after you you know this as a podcast host, when you interview a lot of people, you start to see conflicting theories all over the place. But the, one of the unifying theories I see amongst everybody who has a slant in nutrition is everybody's pretty pro-fermented food. 
is there a, any person who should not be eating fermented foods? Well, some people actually have to kind of take it slowly, just like some of my patients introducing really any plant material into them when they've got a really destroyed wall of their gut can be mischievous. We've certainly seen people, I'll give you an example. There's a, a keystone species in our gut called Acromancia mucinophila. Yep. Yep. And it's it's a really important species, and it lives in the mucus layer of our gut, which really protects our gut from mischief, and it eats mucus. Now you think, well, wait a minute, mucus is good, and it's eating mucus? That, that sounds like a bad thing. But the more mucus it eats, the more mucus is produced by the wall of our gut. So it's it's actually a, a plus win. And we can measure acromancia in our patients and most people with leaky gut or with an autoimmune disease or dysbiosis really don't have any acromancia. And so you could give some of these people acromancia, and there's several companies that, that make it, both in living form and in dead form, and that's another subject. And some of these people get really severe abdominal pain when they yeah. introduce acromancia. And I think in those people, the their mucus layer is so devoid that acromancia begins to really start chomping on the cells themselves, trying mm -hmm. to get some nourishment. And William Davis makes a case for this. So, and I've seen it in my practice. Some young children who their mothers mm -hmm. gave them acromancia had a bad reaction. Mm -hmm. So it just, it's, it's more complex than meets the eye. So is, are probiotics a risky advent, adventure to dip into? Would you be better off trying to search for these bacteria in food? Well, I think, yeah, back in the good old days, these bacteria and more importantly, these bacterial products were in the foods we ate. Right. And you, yeah. you look at these ancient cultures, fermentation was really, number one, the only way to preserve food. We didn't have refrigerators, and it was the only way to preserve food by actually eating the sugar molecule. So wine is preserved grape juice, and it has the products of fermentation. So some of my patients say, doggone it, I'm having fermented foods every night. And yeah. uh, uh, God bless you, Dr. Gundry, and great, great suggestion. <laughs> and they're just not to change the subject, but there is a cool human trial of looking at gut microbiome diversity, comparing red wine, the equivalent calories in grape juice, and the equivalent calories in gin. And lo and behold, it was actually the red wine that promoted gut diversity and improved gut wall health. The grape juice had no effect, and the gin actually had a very negative effect. Wow, you just you just put a huge smile on my face. I'm a like you, a very I I have a a soft spot for a good bottle of wine. So, does it matter then is it need to be biodynamic, natural? I mean, of course it goes down that path. Well, yeah. I mean, most of our California wines have glyphosate in them. Yeah. I was a few years ago I was talking to Michael Mondavi, who's Robert Mondavi's son who runs Mondavi. And he said it took us 10 years to get glyphosate out of our soil and our vineyards. 10 mm. years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. And, uh, yeah. This, this stuff is just everywhere. 